In this video, we are going to try to evaluate integral from negative infinity to infinity of sine x over x dx, which is graphed right here. And you can imagine the x-axis going through something like this. And near x equals to 0, we know sine x over x is going to approach 1 from our calculus class. And we see that sine is oscillating up and down as you're approaching infinity, but the oscillation is decreasing in magnitude thanks to dividing by x. So how, how do we actually evaluate this? Well, in this video, I'm going to present to you an approach using contour integration from complex analysis. And I want to start by giving you a pretty hand-wavy argument for how to find the value of this, or uh, the way I would do it if I had to do it quickly. And after that, I can give you some su suggestions for how to formalize it if you'd like. So how we are going to do this, if you think of this as the complex plane, where we have the real axis here and the imaginary axis here, the integral we want to evaluate goes from negative infinity to infinity in the real line. So we are really evaluating along, along this path. So we're evaluating si integral of sine of x over x along negative infinity to infinity on the real line. But what we're going to do instead is we are going to integrate along a path that looks something like this. So we are going to start at negative r for some large r. And eventually, we're going to take the limit as r goes to infinity. So we are essentially going from negative infinity to infinity. But we're going to go like this. We're going to go along this path, but we're going to stop at minus epsilon. Then we're going to circle around, stop at epsilon. And then we're going to continue all the way to r. And then, and then we are going to circle around like this. So the path we're integrating looks something like this. And rather than integrating sine z over z, we're going to integrate e to the iz over z for the reason that's going to become apparent soon. But for now, let me just say exponential function is sometimes better behaved than the sine function. So we're going to use e to the iz instead. And you may be like, what is going on? Why are we even considering something like this? Well, to begin with, the reason that our path is shaped like this is so we can apply what's called Cauchy's theorem. And what Cauchy's theorem essentially tells you, and I'll be a little hand wavy here, is that if we have a region like this, which does not have any holes, and if we have a differentiable function, so if we have a complex differentiable function like e to the iz over z, in this region, then if we call this entire path gamma, so gamma is the path that we have like this. And if gamma is a closed path, so that the starting point of gamma and the ending point of gamma are the same, in that case, integral of our differential function over gamma dc actually turns out to be zero. And this is a fascinating, really beautiful theorem from complex analysis that we are taking for granted. Essentially, the reason we are circling around here is because there is a problem at zero. At zero, we are dividing by zero, so it's not differentiable. So that's why our contour is going around. And how we can proceed now is that if you look at this part of the path, so if you look at the path from negative r to minus epsilon, and if you look at the path from epsilon to r, let's call the union of these two paths gamma 1. Then what is integral of gamma 1 of e to the iz over z dz as, as r gets very large and epsilon goes to zero? Well, something that you may or may not remember, if you take if you have e to the ix, where x is real, then e to the ix is equal to cosine x plus i times sine of x. So if we take the limit as r is going to go off to infinity and epsilon is going to go to zero, so we're essentially closing the path along the real line. And if we take the imaginary part of this entire thing, then it may be reasonable to expect that since the imaginary part is exactly going to get a sine z over z here, we are going to get the integral that we want, integral from negative infinity to infinity of sine x over x dx. And this actually turns out to be the case. So we have this along gamma 1. What happens along this green path from minus epsilon going upstairs back down to epsilon? Well, so if we call this path from minus epsilon to epsilon as gamma 2, now I'm going to use another fact from complex analysis, which states that if I integrate 1 over z along a path, so if this is 0, and along a path that looks something like this with angle data, and you're just circling around starting at this point all the way around to this point, then it actually turns out this is exactly data times i. So I'll take this fact for granted. 
So in particular, if I integrate gamma 2 of 1 over z dz, then gamma 2 we are essentially going the angle of pi, but you are going the opposite way. Rather than going counterclockwise, we're going clockwise. So it, it's reasonable to expect this is minus pi i, and this actually indeed turns out to be the case. And you may ask, why does this matter? Well, it matters because if you look at e to the i z over z dz, so let me go down a bit then remember e to some power is one plus that thing plus that thing squared over two factorial and so on. And we're dividing by z here. And now I'm going to use what's called the big O notation. Real, look at this part, the tail of the series. Realize that the order of growth of this is O of z. So when I say big O of z here, I mean this is approximately growing at the rate of z times some constant, say, as z gets very, very small. And the intuition for this is that if z is very small, so as epsilon is approaching zero, then all of these terms are going to be tiny in magnitude compared to iz. So it's really behaving like some constant times z. So we have an O of z growth here. So when we divide by z, that's going to get us one over z plus O of z divided by z, which is approximately O of 1, and O of 1 basically means you are, you are acting like a constant as epsilon is going to 0. So now what happens when I integrate gamma 2 of e to the i z over z dz is that, first of all, I'm integrating 1 over z along gamma 2, which gets us minus pi i, and we're integrating what's approximately upper bounded by a constant function along a path. Well, if you look at the length or the circumference of the path, gamma 2, then realize this is just O of epsilon. The circumference or the parameter of the semicircle is pi times the radius, and here radius is epsilon. So what we really get is this constant times the length of the path. So we have plus O of epsilon. So as long as you take limit as epsilon goes to zero, we are just going to get, we're just going to get minus pi i. So to summarize, along this path, when we integrate e to the i z over z d z and you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, we should get minus pi i. So in particular, if I also take the imaginary part of this, then we should just get minus pi. And finally, we have this path to analyze. So let's go down and consider that. And this is the hardest one in some sense. So this is r and this is minus r and you're going around like this, let's call it gamma 3. And now I will give you a very rough intuition that we will try to justify more rigorously later on in this video. And that's to realize that if you're along this part of the path, along near the top, then you are approximately i times r, because that's exactly the point here. And now, this is the reason why we really wanted exponential instead of sine. If you consider what the value of e to the iz is, at ir, well, that's e to the minus r, because i squared is 1. And this is going to go to 0 very quickly as you take limit as r going to infinity. So something that you may expect, and this is just an intuition for now, is that limit as r goes to infinity of this thing is actually 0. And now, assuming all of this, we are basically done. Because we know integral along the entire path by Cauchy's theorem should be 0. But we, we are splitting up this entire path gamma into gamma 1 plus, plus gamma 2 plus gamma 3. So we know integral along the entire path is 0. And when we take the limit as r going to infinity and epsilon going to 0, and we take the imaginary part, that means the sum of all of these right-hand side should be 0 when we sum them up because the integral along the entire path was zero, and that exactly implies, of course, that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of sine x over x dx must be pi. And this indeed turns out to be the correct answer. Well, now the only problem with this argument is really that I was assuming a few things and I was skipping some steps. So for the more advanced audience, I just wanna quickly go through the argument again and quickly sketch how we can formalize everything. So the first problem is in the assumption that we are making in this equality, that when we take the limit as r goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero and take the imaginary part, why do we actually get this integral? So this equality is what we want to justify, where our gamma one is 
going like this from negative r to minus epsilon, then epsilon to r, you're taking this limit and an imaginary part. Well, first of all, remember that as z is real here, we do indeed have that this is equal to cosine z plus i times sine of z. And when you look at cosine z over z along the real line, so when we divide this by z, then this is actually an odd function. And because it's an odd function, when we integrate from minus r to minus epsilon, and you add the result of integrating from epsilon to r, so when we integrate this along gamma 1, then this thing, of course, is going to be 0. So really, so since that's 0, even when we take the limit, it's going to stay 0. So when we take the limit and take the imaginary part, this entire left-hand side really reduces to limit as r going to infinity of integral from minus r to r of the sine z over z dz. So now the only problem is that it might be true that limit of integral from minus r to r of sine z over z dz exists, but maybe this integral does not exist. So really the only thing that's left to show this equality is to show that this thing actually is well defined. And how you can do this, I'll just sketch it once again, is to use integration by parts. You use integration by parts where you're differentiating sine of x and you're integrating 1 over x dx, and that's exactly going to get you something like, say, cosine x, over x squared dx, and if you look at something like 1 over x squared dx from, say, 1 to infinity, because the only problem with this integral that you can have is as x blows up, maybe something bad happens, because when x is close to 0, say, sine x over x is actually about 1, so everything is fine. So we, we just have to show that something like this exists after you integrate by parts, but this is clear since that's less than infinity. So you can justify this like that. The second and perhaps more serious problem is how do we actually justify that this thing is zero? Sure, near like this point of the contour, you're around IR, so it makes sense that the integral goes to zero, but how do you know there aren't any problems near these portions of the contour? And this is actually pretty tricky to justify. One way of doing this is to realize that integrating from along the semicircle is integrating along R times E to the I data, where our angle is going between 0 and pi. So this entire integral becomes integral from 0 to pi of e to the i times z, which is r e to the i data, over z, which is r e to the i data, and dz. And dz, when you differentiate this, is exactly going to be r i e to the i data d data. But you want to show something like this is going to go to 0 when you take the limit. So really, you only care about the absolute value of the integrand. So when, we, when I take the absolute value, so I'm going to use this notation for, again, big O. So when I write f less than less than g, that means f is actually big O of g. So I'm just using this to show that this side is really bounding this from above. Well, e to the i data, that's just in the unit circle. So that has magnitude 1. e to the i data is magnitude 1. i has magnitude 1 r and r cancelled out. So really the only term that matters is e to the i r e to the i data. So this part. So you want to analyze e to the i r e to the i data. This is something you may know. In this case, you only care about e to the real part of the exponent. And because e to the i data is cosine data plus i sine data, the real part is exactly going to turn out to be minus r sine data. So really the entire thing comes down to analyzing e to the minus r sine data d data and showing that this goes to zero as r goes to infinity. And this actually isn't too hard because if you consider what sine data looks like, so this is the graph of sine data from zero to pi, but in particular between zero and pi over two, so if you consider this to be, it's a bit, bit not perfect to scale, but if you consider what happens at pi over two, the sine data is bounded below bounded below by a line. So let this line is like some slope times data. So when I get the negative sign, then minus sine data is actually bounded above by minus m data. And since when you're integrating from 0 to pi, and sine is essentially symmetric from 0 to pi over 2, and from pi over 2 to pi, you have this inherent symmetry, you really only have to consider integral from 0 to pi over 2 up to a constant factor. And once again, the the exponent is going to be bounded above by minus r m data, d data, and this you can easily integrate, take r going to infinity, and you can easily show that this goes to zero. And this justifies 
this justifies this equality as well. And that's really all the ingredients that you need to finish the proof that integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine x over x dx is exactly pi.